I'm so excited to be here today. This is Lisa Niver from We Said Go Travel, and I am honored to have as my guest the award-winning and incredible author, Alka Joshi. Hi, Alka. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that I'm talking to you. It's so exciting. I absolutely love, love, love your books. Oh. Um, so we first found each other when I wrote about the henna artist for Ms. Magazine. And congratulations. What was it like to be a Reese Witherspoon Book of the Month? That was an amazing experience. And it came right on the heels of a pandemic start that also put the kibosh on the launch of my book. So every single book event got canceled, every library shut down, every bookstore closed down right at the start of my release date, which was March the 10th, 2020. And oh HarperCollins and Mira Books had been setting up all of these great launch events and all these interviews and everything, all the conferences I was supposed to be at, the panel discussions they set me up for, and everything was canceled. So you know, I allowed myself to wallow in self-pity for two days because I had spent 10 or 12 years putting this book together. And I just thought, oh my God, I'd spent all this time and I did everything that I was supposed to, or what my literary agent told me to, what my editors told me to. Now the book is finally out there. It's waiting to be put up on bookshelves and all the doors are closing, closing, closing. And I just thought, Oh my God, what karma am I carrying around from a, a past life that is causing this to happen? So, um, so yeah, so then Reese Witherspoon's announcement came uh, about three or four weeks after my failed book launch, my, my book launch that never was. And that was a complete stunner. So what I had done in the meanwhile was I had started to tell all of my social media channels on, on my social media channels, I said, here I am please contact me. I am on lockdown too. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. If you have a book group and you want me to be discussing the book with you, I'm here. And by the way, you can get digital copies. If you can't access physical copies, you can get the ebook, you can get the audio book. And people started responding. Um, not only did people start responding, you're on the New York Times bestsellers list. <laughs> well, yeah. And so that was an amazing thing that happened, but I have to give a lot of kudos to Reese Witherspoon because she's, she said to everybody, I love this book, please read this book. I think you will enjoy it too. That's what she has done for female authors over and over in the last four years. You know, her uh, charter is just to promote female authors because female authors historically don't get the promotion dollars that male authors do. It's just a gender bias that has existed forever. But she said, I could use my influence to give women the kind of exposure that male authors have. And I think in four short years, she has accomplished so much for us. And I am just so grateful that it took a woman to make that change. Right, Lisa? <laughs> yeah, no, I think what she's done has been incredible. And I'm not surprised because The Henna Artist is a, a phenomenal book. So I'm not surprised that she loved it and she used her platform to promote it. But we have to talk about the fact that you have been willing to really shepherd this book. I think, did you speak to more than 400 book clubs? I have, I think I'm on 416 as of today. <laughs> That's incredible because, I mean, just to have emailed over 400 book clubs would take a lot of effort, but to actually make the time and, and show up and calendar across time zones and I imagine across continents you've been seeing. Right, right. And also um, one of the other things I did was I responded to every direct message I received. Every direct message on Facebook, every one that I received on uh, Instagram. And, you know, I think that part of that is my discipline running my own agency for 25 years. Because when you run your own business, you know that um, people really appreciate prompt answers, prompt responses. They want uh, to know that what they asked you for is going to be given to them. 
also, I remember being a reader and writing to authors, you know, with that sort of stargaze in my eye and just uh, thinking, oh, I loved your book so much. And here's what I loved about it. And um, just hoping for a response back. You know how it is with uh, the people we admire. We want at least some acknowledgement of the fact that we wrote to them and that we love their book. And I never, ever, ever got a response back. But I thought I'm going to be different. I'm going to be the kind of author who is going to respond to people and say, oh, I'm so happy that you like the book. What did you like about it? Which character did you love? I, I really responded to that kind of um, uh, message from readers and I wanted to communicate with them. And I think, Lisa, I don't know if things would have been different if it hadn't been for the pandemic, because in the pandemic, I, like everybody else, wanted to connect to people. Mm -hmm. And what better way to connect than to say, hey, thanks so much for reading my book. You know, what did you enjoy most about it? And are you trying any of the recipes that are in the back of the book? You know, <laughs> things like that. I really uh, wanted to connect with people. And I think everybody else was hunger, hungry for connection too. So I think it kind of all worked out maybe uh, because of the climate, because of what was happening in the world, uh, because of Reese Witherspoon. It's just all of a sudden, all the forces came together. And you know what the Buddhists say? What? They say you are exactly where you're supposed to be right now at any given moment. Well, that is a beautiful thought during this challenging and uncertain time. But the one thing you didn't mention all of those things did come together, but you also wrote an incredible, incredible novel. And, and the thing that I was drawn to when I wrote about it for Ms. Magazine is I really felt like I was back in India. You know, the book is, there's so much sensory information, like the taste of the cooking or the smell of the, the, the you know, the women dressed up at the party or, or how did the henna look on the hands? Like it's very, I felt like it's like, I could almost touch India again. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. One of the um, most, uh, I think, rewarding comments that I have received uh, from the books is that people feel they are back in Jaipur. And I'm not just talking about people who've never been to Jaipur, but I'm talking about the Indians who also respond, the South Asians who say, I have been to Jaipur and I felt like I was back. Or I live in Jaipur and this takes me back to the 1950s. Or I have traveled to Jaipur or I still live in India and I now I want to go to Jaipur because of this book. So um, one of the most rewarding things is to have people from the country you're writing about also validate everything you've written and say, I get it. I was there, my mother was there, or my grandfather was there. I get this story because it relates to my family. Oh my God, that is so rewarding when that happens. I, I really so much was thinking about being on the bus in India and, and you know, buying things from street vendors. It, it definitely one of the highlights for me of being stuck at home in COVID was to read and feel like I was in a place. But I think, you're right. People that live there, people that have visited there feel it, but we also feel all the intergenerational connections and the, the relationships and the loss. And you're a tremendous writer. Thank you so much. And uh, so Lisa, like during COVID, during this lockdown, you yes. have traveled all over the world. Did you feel during this lockdown that you were somehow imprisoned here? Or did you feel like this was a moment <laughs> to reflect on all of your travels? Um, honestly, it depended on the day. There were moments. I've been home in LA now, I think about four, about 426 days, now that I'm counting. And there have been moments when I felt imprisoned and, and being able to read a book like The Henna Artist or um, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, which you want to let everyone know is coming out next month. And I actually think I might have even loved The Secret Keeper of Jaipur a tiny bit more because <laughs> I, I already knew all the characters and the backstory and I was like, oh, my friends are back. I so think that to me has been such a joy of this, I've been calling it the great pause. And for me, I was, I actually worked on my own book, uh, not fiction and a memoir about, about my travels and about my divorce. So 
I feel that I've used this time well. Um, I, I don't think I would have picked it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but I, go ahead. But I think Lisa, I, I, you know, I think a lot about our purpose in life. I think a lot about um, why we're here on this planet. And I do feel that our response to moments like this is what shapes us. Mm. And our response to moments like this is a result of all the moments that have come before it and what we have learned from them and what we have learned about how to react to them. You know, so I think that the pandemic was actually a wonderful way for us to test what we've learned in our lives, how we move forward uh, when we're given these limitations. In the, in the very similar way that I think the characters of the henna artists and the secret keeper of Jaipur move forward given the limitations of their lives, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, um, I, I would recommend to everybody who's listening to us to read the henna artist first. And if you've already read it, read it again. And I even saw it at Costco, so congratulations. <laughs> But even more important, you can already pre-order the next book, which I have to tell you, I really, really loved. Um, the one thing I think we have to talk about right now is what's going on in India today. We've talked about COVID and a friend of mine is working with an organization called um, Calcutta Rescue and, and they're bringing a lot of supplies to India. It's a super challenging time in India right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, Modi, Prime Minister Modi, did everything he could to lock India down. So for two months, India was on lockdown and they were doing better than a lot of other nations they in keeping really COVID. Were. Yeah, in keeping COVID at bay. But like the United States, India is a, uh, an amalgamation of many different states. And each state gets to determine when they wanted to stop the lockdown. And I totally understand, even here in the United States, a lot of pressure that politicians are receiving from businesses saying, I'm going under. Unless I have business coming in, unless I have patrons, I am going to go under. I cannot keep this business afloat. And so the states in India started responding to that pressure and opening up their borders and opening up uh, everybody coming in and going out. And that really exacerbated COVID so that we are in this situation today where we've got millions and millions of people infected. Now, I think that what is really wonderful right now is First of all, we have a president who is responding to this pandemic in a way that we want uh, that president to be responding. So uh, President Biden has really managed COVID here in the United States. Consequently, we have all these vaccines that are sitting around that are not being used. We can send them to India as he is doing. Other countries are responding in a similar way. I think that once again, this is a sign of how we respond during these moments of crisis, even as a global unit, global you know entity. And so nations are rising to help India to say, okay, you know we've got vaccines. Here are the vaccines. Please, you know, try to use them. See see what can be managed. And I think that, you know, that will go a long ways towards not only global unity, yes. but also helping India through this moment of crisis. And of course, I'm hoping that everything will get managed by the time the TV series is ready to be filmed <laughs> in India. <laughs> I, I, that was such a good segue. I was going to ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about the television series? I, I didn't know it was going to be filmed in India. That's amazing. Yeah. So the idea is, of course, that we would film it in all of the settings, and it's mainly Jaipur and it's Shimla. Uh, I think that um, right now uh, it would be very difficult to recreate those two settings here in the United States. So um, the plan has always been to film in India. Of course, that was before, you know, everything worsened in India. So we're not quite sure how it's all going to play out, but, um, you know, it will be what it will be and it will happen when it's supposed to happen. So I think it's all uh, going to be just lush and gorgeous when it does happen. And right now what's happening is all the pre-production work. And as you probably know, 
there's a lot of work that happens before a, a, you see something on a big screen or a little screen. So there's all of this developmental work that has to go into it, all of the writing, uh, the rewriting of all the episodes, uh, the casting, uh, fi figuring out who the director is going to be, who the cinematographer is going to be, you know, the main crew. So there's a lot of work that's going to go into this before we see it uh, on the screen. But I'm so excited. Do you know, do you know this, the scene that I am most looking forward to um, uh, you know, seeing how they're going to do this on the big screen is the scene where Lakshmi is dancing in her home on that patterned floor. On the mosaic? Yeah. And there are those little candles set up alongside the room and that's the only light in the room. So uh, the light is impacting her feet. It's illuminating that fast movement of her feet. That is the rhythm of the Kathak dance. I cannot wait to see how they do this. And I can't wait to see how they recreate the floor because so far it's only just been in my imagination. <laughs> that's incredible. I mean, what a great honor to have your your the world you created be created for this for television this is for television for streaming uh shows um and i am really lucky in that i have this team of people that i really trust so michael edelstein is the executive producer who first got a copy of the henna artist and said oh my gosh this could be an indian downton abbey because <laughs> He'd been in charge of NBC Universal in England when Downton Abbey, in the studios, when Downton Abbey was being filmed. And he is really uh, one of the people who made it a global success. So he knows what goes into a TV show like that. And he really thought that we had the same kind of uh, circumstances in the henna artist. We have the upstairs class and we have the downstairs class. Mm -hmm. We have all of these stories of each character woven throughout the narrative, just like in Downton Abbey. Every single character has a story that they're trying to tell in every episode. So he, he saw the whole thing and he thought, oh my gosh, this could be so Downton Abbey-ish. And then he called Frida Pinto <laughs> and said, I'm sending you this book. I think you would be an amazing Lakshmi. Now, the reason that they know each other is because they met each other at an ashram years ago and they have been friends ever since and sometimes wow. they go to the ashram together yeah and uh so Frida was on board as soon as she read this read the the henna artist and that is kind of how it snowballed and then Michael has a first look deal with Miramax TV so he called them and said okay you guys want to pitch you something and they said oh my god absolutely so that's kind of how it's all evolved and uh, I really feel like this is the team that is going to make the henna artist as true to its original essence as possible on the screen. It's really incredible, all your success. And, and I think from here, talking about, you know, the henna artist was a Reese Witherspoon book. Now you have the TV show, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur is coming out next month. You're in Costco. But I think it's really, really important to talk about the journey. And I know you said um, earlier, 10 to 12 years. I know you found an agent and you worked with her for some time. And you, I think you, when we, when I took the class you gave at Kepler's, did you say you rewrote the book 12 times? Uh, actually, I think what you're reading of the henna artist is the 30th draft of the book. Three yeah. zero, three zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so much of that is because as you're learning how to write a novel, you are learning how to become an expert in something that is new to you. And uh, for example, when you become a, an Olympic skier, you have to put in a lot of hours before you can qualify for the Olympics, right? Uh, when you are um, a master gardener, you have to put in a lot of hours in a lot of people's gardens in order to become a master gardener. It's the same thing with writing a novel. You have to learn how to sustain the reader's interest over 300, 400, 500 pages, however, however much you're writing. 
And you have to learn how to make sure that each character has a story arc so that they are not left the same from the beginning to the end of the book. There is a transformation that has happened. Otherwise, we wouldn't read the book. We want to know how people change. We want to know how they grow, because I think a lot of times we use fiction as a way to pattern our real lives. We use fiction as a model for how we can react to circumstances, how we can grow from circumstances that we're facing. That's really beautiful. And I think you're right that we see all of those character arcs. You've written them so beautifully. And I know you've spoken about patterning um, Lakshmi on your mom. Is that right? Yes. And uh, I really feel that, you know, when you start with an intention that is a passionate one. So my intention was um, that I wanted to reimagine a life for my mother that she did not get to live a life where she gets to decide what her future is going to look like. So um, in The Henna Artist, uh, I created Lakshmi as a way to reimagine my mother and uh, a person who can leave her marriage, who deserts her marriage before children are born. And then she goes on to forge a life of her own. She starts a career that is just her own. She um, she has success in her life because of her intelligence and her wit and her talent, not because somebody else set it up for her. So I wanted this to be um, a stand in for my mother and a life that I think she could have had. Now, of course, I take a lot of liberties in this by uh, you know, making her a henna artist. My mother said, honey, I don't think I could ever have been a henna artist. You know, I don't have that kind of talent. And uh, you've made Lakshmi do this henna art that is so amazingly you know, intricate. And that's not the way that the henna art was being done in the 1950s. It was actually very crude and it was um, kind of primitive looking. And I said, mom, that's okay because I need for this main character to be so good at what she's doing that she gets to be seated in the, uh, on the same divans as her ladies. She gets to be invited to things like the Shakespeare festival that Parvati puts on for her son. Uh, she gets to uh, be a confidant of these elite ladies. And that wouldn't have happened had she been just uh, another henna artist of that period. So I needed for her to be extra special. My mom said, okay, all right, fine. But I think that when you start with a passion like that, when you start with an intention that is very much inside you and you feel like you have to write about it, then I think that you will always be successful. If you're starting out with an intention that is only meant to imitate what somebody else has done, or that is only meant to um, sort of uh, imagine uh, a, a lifestyle that you have never lived or researched or known about, right. then I think that the falsity of that shows through. So I think it's really important whenever a new writer asks me, uh, you know, what do I need in order to succeed? I always say that you need three Ps. First is the passion, the intention that you start with. Why are you writing this? Why you? Why at this particular time do you feel you need to write about this? Uh, secondly, it's perseverance because you have to stick through as many drafts as it takes to get it to the point where somebody wants to buy it and put it out there in the world. And then the last is patience. You know, I am a very impatient person. I think that I should be uh, immediately good at whatever it is I take up. And so I had to learn to be patient with myself. My husband is very good at reminding me about these kinds of things when I get impatient with myself. Like, why aren't I finished already? Why aren't I published already? Why in the world is this COVID thing, you know, uh, keeping me back? And he'll just say, you know what, honey? It just takes patience. And, it, and uh, you need to be patient with yourself because you can't become good at something overnight. So um, he really keeps me grounded. You know, I think we all need someone like that in our lives, whether it's our parents or a best friend or somebody who always says, "Be e go easy on yourself. You can't accomplish everything all at once. Well, wait, I, I just want to ask a question because I, I believe you that he keeps you grounded and, and he's helping you, but wasn't he also a tiny bit of the inspiration to go towards writing? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I think within a year of our marriage, and we've been married now almost 26 years, but within a year of our marriage, he said to me, he goes, 
you know, honey, I think the reason you married me is because you want to be a writer because see, he was a writer. He uh, went through the Stanford program and he got an MFA at Stanford in creative writing. And I met him years later, uh, but I was so attracted to him at, because I think he was a writer. I love writers. I just love the fact that, you know, they create worlds out of their imaginations. I love the fact that they can make me feel things that I didn't even know I could feel and that they are reminding me of parts of myself that maybe I hadn't given a voice to. So I love that about writers. I just think they're so incredible, just like I love artists. I think I love anybody who can really create something out of nothing. And uh, so, yes, I fell in love with him because of his writing. And then he said, I think you really also want to be a writer. And I said, no, 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 no. No, you know, I just write commercials. That's all I do. I write commercials. I write marketing brochures. That's what I do. And he said, no, no, no. I think that you could be a phenomenal writer in, you know, for long form fiction. I think you should try it. You should take some evening classes. You should figure out, you know, what to do. And I said, no, no you know, I have to work. I have, you know, we have to pay bills. We have to pay the mortgage, all of that. And he said, I think that there will come a time when you will want to do this. And, and it, it, it happened. It happened, but it happened like 15 years into our marriage. And I finally said, okay, you know, I've got a couple of years ahead of me here where there is going to be this mortgage crisis. Uh, there's a recession looming. And I know that my business uh, in my own um, advertising uh, agency is going to slow down because that's what happens with every kind of, you know, uh, major economic crisis. You always have this uh, recession that, that uh, happens. And I thought, okay, maybe for the next two years, I do something else with my life. And that's when I decided to enter this MFA program in creative writing. You're such an inspiration. I mean, that's, that's incredible that you have, what a great relationship where you really want each other to grow. Yeah. And what a gift he gave you to believe that you could do it so that you could give us the gift of these two incredible books. Yeah. Now, I think one time I heard you mention there might be a third book on the horizon. That's right. <laughs> so currently I am writing book number three in the trilogy and then the trilogy will end. Um, so book number one is about Lakshmi primarily. Book number two really focuses on Malik as an adult. Book number three focuses on Radha as an adult. So Radha will be the same age that Lakshmi was in The Henna Artist. Radha is 30 now in book number three that I'm writing. And Radha is a perfumer or she works in a lab um, a uh, fragrance lab uh, for a major master perfumer. And uh, by the way, the perfumer is a woman because it's very important for me to always put women in these leadership positions that I think they've always been in, but we haven't always recognized that they've been there. So this is a woman in a leadership position. She's a master perfumer. Radha works for her. And Radha is on the cusp of helping her design a signature scent for a client. Now, there's a knock at the door. And on the other side of the door is going to be somebody that Radha has not seen in 18 years, not since the henna artist. Wow. And yes, and that is going to throw her completely off balance. She is in uh, love with her husband. She is, she has two little children. Her husband is Parisian, which is how she ended up in Paris. So that is where she works as a perfumer. And, you know, she's developed this whole life that she always wanted, this kind of exotic, wonderful <laughs> life. And she has the family she always wanted. But now having this person show up after 18 years is really going to um, stun her into a whole new kind of uh, awakening. Oh my goodness, so exciting. So it's just, I really feel so inspired. I, I know you've shared in many of the conversations I've listened to about you that, you know, it, it, you have been patient, you have been perseverant, you have had passion, and now you have, you know, the henna artist is available. The, C, the Secret Keeper of Jaipur, where's the best place that people can pre-order the second book that comes out? Is it, it's next month in June. Yes, on June 22nd, it releases, but people can pre-order it anywhere. They can order it uh, from their favorite independent bookstore, from Barnes & Noble, from Indigo stores up in Canada, from Amazon, uh, from, uh, uh, from Walmart, 
from uh, Target. And then also um, they can buy the, um, the uh, um, audio version. Now, what was really cool, Lisa, is I got to pick the narrator in uh, the audio version of the henna artist. And she was so good that she took us all the way to the New York Times on the audiobook list as well. Wow. Now, I wanted her to also narrate the, the Secret Keeper, but in the Secret Keeper, we have three different points of view. We have narrators that are changing from Lakshmi to Malik to Nimi, uh, yep. who is Malik's love interest. So now I have three different narrators, and the same narrator who narrated for Lakshmi is coming back in the audio version of The Secret Keeper as Lakshmi, but then I needed to hire two other ones, or I needed to actually select. Okay. Uh, Harper Collins actually, you know, hires them, but I just needed to select who was going to be Malik's voice and who was going to be Nimi's voice, and I listened to a whole bunch of audition tapes in order to determine uh, who was going to play who. So this uh, audiobook has turned out just great also and i'm so excited so that if people you know want to be traveling uh while they listen to the book or if they want to be exercising while they listen to the book th the secret keeper of Jaipur is available also on uh, libro fm and they are featuring it libro fm is featuring it as their june uh, selection uh you know or as their may book selection wow. uh, so it would be wonderful if people also ordered from libro fm yeah, there's so many things. And so there's so much excitement. I, I'm just really, I'm so inspired by you. And I just want to offer you the most giant congratulations that you really built this whole empire of this trilogy and the TV series during what for many people has been the most challenging, difficult, uncertain time that you've used this as a platform to reach out to well over 400 book groups. If people want to invite you to their book group. Are you still going out to book groups? I mean, digitally, but are they still available? Absolutely. Alka at alkajoshi.com. <laughs> what could be easier? <laughs> yeah, that is. And, and also I think Instagram is a, a big way in which uh, people DM me for book clubs. And that is always really fun. And of course, um, I'm, I've been teaching a lot of workshops, you know, on how you transition from just a sort of uh, homespun writer to becoming a published writer. So that is really exciting for me. And then I think just connecting with people like you, Lisa, has been such a good part of this journey. It's been so rewarding to meet people like you. And you're coming out with your own memoir, which I'm very excited about because you're going to write about your travels. So many people are dying to travel right now, but I think we're all still a little weary of going forward and putting ourselves in any kind of danger. So uh, I think that reading your memoir is going to help people uh, maybe travel in a way digitally or, you know, through a book that they won't be able to travel uh, physically to. Yes. Well, hopefully from your mouth to the pen of a literary agent who wants to sign me, that would be <laughs> a great COVID success since I finished the book proposal. So it's it. But I, I do remember writing to you after I read your book and you were so kind, just like you said earlier in this interview that you've really written to people and you've been so generous with your time. And I imagine your family really appreciates all of your Indian food recipes and the gardening and and yeah. that you have you know, created this world for us to walk in, but also there's so many things we can take away about, like you said, how fiction yeah. helps us think how we can live differently. Yeah. You know, my dad is such a big uh, fan of me, <laughs> which is as it should be, right? You know, our parents should be big fans of us. And every couple of days, he will write to me and say, I am so proud of you. You know, I just saw that, you know, uh, on your Instagram, you know, he follows me on Instagram. He follows me on Facebook. He's so hilarious. And, uh, you know, he's always telling his friends about me. So he'll forward uh, messages that he receives from his friends saying, I just read your daughter's book and I really <laughs> liked it. And so he'll forward those to me. I mean, he's just, he's adorable. He's 89. And I'm so glad that one of my parents lived to see uh, what I wrote about India and about these Indian characters. That's been very meaningful to me as well. But I think Lisa, you know, you have a generosity of spirit also. I think that one of the best things we can do in a thing like a pandemic or any kind of 
obstacle that we face in life is to really look at everything we already have, the, all that gratitude that we need to keep in mind about, okay, you know what, I have my health, or I have my books, or I have my spirit, or I have my creativity, or I have legs and I can move uh, around in my neighborhood. I can say hello to people, even if from a distance, or I can say hello to them on Zoom. I can get involved in activities. I can learn a new craft. There's so many different things that people can do during a time like this. And I think that you and I understand what it is to then acknowledge that all the all the great things that we have in our lives and i really do think that it helps us move forward yes well that was very beautiful this has been such an honor to spend this time with you i wish you only the most incredible continued success i hope that everyone buys the henna artist if they haven't already read it definitely read that and pre-order the secret keeper of jaipur i mean it sounds like you should get the book and the audiobook because it's gonna be so good and then i can't wait till we can have a launch party and watch the tv series <laughs> okay you're on lisa <laughs> and now maybe we'll actually be able to be in the same room yeah <laughs> someday <laughs> Someday. And then, and then you'll get to see all the fabulous pajamas down below here. <laughs> uh, the magic of Zoom. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye.